Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tom and Joe Show. Uh, I'm Joe. I'm Tom. <laughs> and uh, welcome to our Patreon exclusive that I will break free eventually. But uh, today we have my choice, which we are doing the recent uh, Foo Fighters <laughs> Going Disco album where they changed themselves into the DGs called Hail Satin. <laughs> Because, hey, it's... why not? <laughs> that That is a very 90s joke if I've ever heard one. That is, that um, is a, that's like up there with like Hail Santa and, you know, the usual sort of thing. There, there's literally a joke from a 90s John Ritter movie where he is like in hell, but hell is a television station. And it's just like they go into a Wayne's World parody that just doesn't parody very much. And it's just like uh, there's a sign that's like that there's an eye. And then there's a warship, and then there's a piece of satin, and he's like, I worship satin? <laughs> it, it, it explains how well thought out the rest of the movie is. It, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we should discuss what we're discussing now. <laughs> so, yeah, it's basically a... Now, this is the thing. This is like record store day is like a big thing in terms of, you know, music codes. You get, you know, limited editions. You get stuff that like, you know, limited pressings of stuff. And bands tend to do kind of interesting things with it. They'll release stuff that like, you know, um, and it'll go from anything from like, you know, extremely rare mixes of albums to this album is a different color. Therefore, you're going to pay £85 for it. And, you know, <laughs> uh, and it will be get bought by people who, you know, obviously buy this stuff and speculate on it for, you know, the, the typical thing. So this was originally sort of done as a, you know, a record store day exclusive because uh, kind of the very much the thing is this is that, yes, these are there are these five reason these five bgs covers done by the foo fighters in character so to speak as the dgs but the other sort of side of this because yeah this is a vinyl exclusive actually as a physical object is uh mostly live foo fighters tracks from something or other. i'm not entirely sure where these even come from i think they're just live in studio sort of performances of stuff mm -hmm. for all for medicine the most recent Studio album Medicine at Midnight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is... I was excited when I heard this, first heard about this. Mm. It's like, oh, this could be an awesome album, but it's kind of a record day gimmick, and mm. it feels like it. And I, I was kind of like, oh, But, yeah. you know, gave it a few lessons, and, you know, it it's grown on me a little bit. It... Um, my problem is I have grown up with the originals. Yeah. Because um, I, I do have the uh, Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. And uh, the Bee Gees and the Foo Fighters are very different beasts. And yeah. how they handle things are very different. Like, hmm. uh, the Bee Gees tunes are smooth. Yeah. It is I'm... like if you had, like, a Kahlua mud slide or something. It's, like, a very smooth. It's got a little bite to it, but it's that goes down yeah. just straight very easily yeah the, the, uh, the Foo fighters very much the opposite on, end <laughs> yeah uh they are whiskey and uh what yeah. you miss mix the whiskey with depends on the album yeah so i mean sometimes you can get uh the first disc of in your honor which is just straight whiskey or you you can get um trying to think of what would be or the second disc of uh you know in your honor which is Probably You're moonshine. Something. Probably moonshine, in well, terms of the probably vibe. Something soft. Pro yeah. Probably something yeah. a lot softer. Hmm. So. Yeah. No, but, I, I agree. Uh, and when I first heard that, <laughs> it's like they are very different with how they are mixed and how they go about it because the instruments play are far more front and center in the DGs than mm. with the the BGs because the BGs is kind of like. It feels like you're at a dance and you're fun and you ask the girl you like to dance and they said yes. And that's just the magical music in the background and it's not interfering with your moment, but it is amplifying it. But yeah. uh, with the DGs, the music is front and center and sometimes the 
uh, vocals kind of get lost when it gets super intense, but that's also part of its charm. Like the the best songs the DGs do are the stuff the more aggressive ones. The BGs I don't think pull off, and yeah. you know we'll get to it. You know, we'll one piece that, at yeah. a time. Yeah. So essentially, what we have over side one is we have you know two. Well, two to three, you know, really big BG songs, which are You Should Be Dancing and rather obligatory The Night Fever, which is like, you know, the probably the most famous BG song. And also Tragedy that I, I think is relatively famous, but it's sort of more famous, at least on this side of the pond, from its cover by uh, pop band Steps, if anybody remembers that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And then the other two tracks, I mean, I, I have to confess, uh, my interest in sort of disco is more towards the stuff done. I mean, such that I have an interest in disco is sort of, you know, and we'll get on to sort of, you know, what it means, what why it's important that America's basically the band that is, you know, very much, you know, uh, the American middle, the most, the most American band that ever America, you know, covering essentially <laughs> disco it is important. But it's sort of like, yeah. you know, my my interest in disco, my knowledge in disco comes more from the European stuff, from things, you know, like Giorgio Moroder, you know, things, you know, mm-hmm. where there is that very electronic, that very, you know, almost precursor to, you know, the proper techno, etc. Yeah. sort of stuff, which which isn't really the Bee Gees wheelhouse, never was the Bee Gees wheelhouse. And, uh, you know, it is a very different breed of disco to American yeah. disco. I I just my big thing was more when you know when I grew up in the '90s and everything mm. was mixing with everything, so you would get uh, just these weird, just throw everything at the wall. Like uh, mm. the first uh, edition of the Low Fidelity All Stars when they were like dark, drugged out disco, like mm. black tar heroin disco is what Oof. I would probably call it, and yeah, that was. It's a really fascinating album. I think we'll talk mm. about it in, sometime in the future. But uh, the, the Bee Gees are more of the baseline when we mm. come to disco. I mean, they do go to, uh, you know, a little touch on a little darker things or a little, you know, more risque yeah. things. Like, you know, Shadow Dancing it has the line, how can I hold you if you're not even mine? And, and you know, Shadow Dancing is like definitely code for fucking. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, they're, yeah. They're, <laughs> So it is casual sex. And <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they do touch on that. But, you know, they are kind of the face of, like, when Gen X would get, like, so sick of disco. Yeah. And they yeah. want harder stuff. They want stuff that represents them. They would be the face of what they hated. So, yeah. you know, even if they touched on these things, they were still kind of had a sense of blandness about them. So, yeah. like I said, they're kind of a baseline. Like, I, what I would have liked is... Uh, the Foo Fighters to have been more adventurous and go to other things, but mm. I get like, this is what you could have easily licensed, even yeah. though you're the Foo Fighters, you can do whatever you damn well please. But yeah, uh, if they were really adventurous, they should. I I would have liked if they had done the uh, Village People's album Renaissance when they tried to become yeah. a new wave album, but they still completely sounded like a disco album because there are <laughs> there are some like out there songs like five o'clock in the morning that I think the Foo Fighters could have nailed, but Oh God, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But there's obviously the, the, the whole thing with, you know, disco as a genre is like, you know, yeah. That's a, so I think we need to sort of talk about, you know, how disco is viewed by, you know, people of your generation or essentially our generation, you know, because yeah, we need to talk about disco sucks. <laughs> So yeah. disc- um, <laughs> I I grew up in like disco sucks and like it the alternative era like mm. when the Foo Fighters came up yeah uh, but mm. uh, it's like the literal commercials in the middle of the night where you have like wait lame white people going hey Jerry I hear disco's making a comeback yeah. I mean, so, think, uh, think, I, think no further than Disco Stew in The Simpsons as to how is how the early 90s viewed Disco. Not very yes. well is the answer to that. But, you know, then you get past yourself, past, 
you know, yeah. oh, I need to be cool and I need to be with mm. these people. And then you listen to it and it's like, actually, this sounds really nice. And they have a mm. wide variety of stuff. And, you know, there's, like yeah. you said, the early electronic stuff. And then yeah. uh, the big things I liked were like Donna Summer's I Feel Love. Yeah, which is still just the most... I mean, there is this famous quote about I Feel Love, which is, you know, this this monolithic, you know, up to 10 minute track, which basically plonks, you know, Donna Summer, who is this this great icon of disco on top of this astonishing mechan- piece, almost mechanical piece of electronic music. And there's a famous quote from Brian Eno. Obviously, this is this is while Brian Eno, because we because I, I'm obsessed with Brian Eno and Brian Eno will keep coming back into these episodes <laughs> through the back door. Brian Eno buys I Feel Love. And this is you know obviously the summer of, you know, 1977. And he goes and plays it to David Bowie, and he says to David Bowie, this is the future. You know, that while he is producing Heroes, you know, the most futuristic David Bowie album that Bowie ever really put together. You know, this blew people's minds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, yeah, the, the problem is that a lot of disco is, you know, from, you know, is this... Is this what we, what I think, you know, obviously the Bee Gees are mostly are this very richly instrumented, very studio based, very, you know, lush production mm-hmm. sort of style. And it's sort of like, and the, the way that obviously the Bee Gees construct these songs are these, you know, stacks on stacks on stacks of sort of, you know, orchestral pieces and, you know, sit, you know, guitars, etc. And it gets this very, you know... And I can understand, you know, that that sort of obviously counterculture. It's it sort of in the same way that counterculture pulled away from progressive rock, which sort of again uh-huh. is this very studio based, this very dense, this very you know complex and almost sort of you know artificial sensibility in music. You know, obviously, but but yeah, we need to talk about this. Go sucks because it's like you know the particularly unfortunate. Uh, moment if disco sucks yeah like disco disaster night which yeah is one of the most infamous black eyes in yeah. baseball <laughs> disco demolition you know where, where basically people go okay we're gonna you know this is the the you know the the end of the uh, the 1970s this is the beginning of the 1980s you know and on you know july the 20th uh, july the 12th 1979 uh, during a White Sox game, because it could, had to be the White Sox, the most cursed game and first cursed team in baseball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, during you know a World uh, was it was it during a World Series or a doubleheader? I think it was. A... Uh, it, it was. Uh, it was, I believe, a uh, regular season game. Okay. I don't remember it being a World Series game. <laughs> no. So because it, it was a promo. You don't do promos during the World Series. Series. No. Yeah. But no, essentially what they do is they they take they basically in the middle of in the middle of centre field, they fill a crate of records. So this is the the size of this crate differs from sort of you know a a reasonably small crate of records to, you know, a largish box. You know that that's probably taller than a man, and they proceed to blow up about blow up its contents, which are disco records. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's like we need to sort of talk and. A lot of it is, you know, obviously a counter thing, but but I think to be honest, you know, you the problem is with it, is the the um, the unfortunate uh, triple header of sexism, racism, and homophobia. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think if it, it was like right at the top of the head, mm. it was kind of a subconscious thing, mm. but it was. This this is lame. This is like how people treated Barney in the '90s or something mm-hmm. like that. This is efficiently lame, but um, I mean, there there is definitely that other layer to it where yeah. it was big with the gay culture and yeah, and, and black know, culture. And and yeah, and absolutely, black, it is like yeah. Uh, <laughs> whoops, that was really really racist in hindsight. And then of course, you know, obviously you get yeah. a a revival of it in the sort of the late '90s to the early 2000s, and you know, and, pretty much culminating i would say with the return of disco as you know the 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 the, the via daft punks um grand Abaxa's memories which is you know the return of big elaborate you know big elaborate yeah. uh, like, uh, they have an entire track on giorgio marauders so yeah that that yeah. tells you what exactly you need to know about yeah. that 
No. And then there's Japan where it like never left <laughs> no, for no. years. Uh, Cause Japan, you'll just like th these fats will die in America. And then for like four or five years, they'll just keep going in Japan. Like there's entire, like all of the anime had like this disco symphonic score for their movies. Like, uh, Galaxy Express 3.9, or yeah. uh, of all things, the Fist of the North Star movie. Which, Disco. <laughs> like, it has, it, the opening is this luscious disco symphonic mm. orchestra, and then everybody's face melts. <laughs> yeah, as you do. <laughs> at, yeah. At, but <laughs> it's, but that, that also happened in, in the 90s when House was big for a while. Mm. Um, and then uh, everybody's like, no, House is lame. We got to go to Nirvana and Alternative. <laughs> and then it switches to... And then Japan's like, uh, that never no. left. So we have like the Streets of Rage 2 soundtrack, one of the greatest soundtracks of all gaming. That is just a one long uh, CNC Music Factory album. So <laughs> Juice. There's that uh, end of yeah. it. And then Lieiji Matsumoto, the director of Galaxy Express 555, proceeds to just wander over to Star Punk and go, Oi, mate, oi. Oh, do you want to move it? Uh, it's Galaxy like, Express 3.9. Galaxy Express 3.9. Yeah. And they go, hey, do you want to make, like, a movie? And it's like, and uh, then we got into 5555. 555, which, which is again, another so, one of the greatest probably, things of all time. Which we will eventually inevitably talk about. Anyway, back to the food but, fighters. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about this. <laughs> so. Which. I, I think um, we'll tackle, I think we'll tackle the sort of the second half of this first. Because, like, the second okay. half of this is... Let's be entirely fair here. Medicine at Midnight was not a good record. <laughs> um, I did not like it. Uh, no. you, you wanted to cover it for uh, one of our Patreon exclusives, and I just like uh, didn't have enough energy yeah. to discuss it. Yeah. And I don't. It's really what it really feels like is uh, they have a bunch of unfinished songs that they yeah. threw in, onto one album. Uh, like there is one song that just sticks out like a sore thumb. Like mm. waiting for a war like these lyrics are like 1995 yeah because it is about a kid in a small town like waiting for something bigger than themselves to happen and uh mm. after 2001 that there's been constantly nothing but things bigger than yourselves happening every day dave how and much bigger than these things get <laughs> so i mean you could have signed up for the war anytime you wanted. Yeah. I, so at this point, this is like the 1995 movie Major Pain, where Major Pain walks over to his, you know, supervisor, XO, what, commanding officer, whatever you would like, and says, must be some guys need some killing. <laughs> and the guy says, we're sorry, Major, you killed them all. Yeah. And Which not is the most yeah. 1995 <laughs> sentiment to like, politics yeah. and war i have Oof. ever heard Oof. and then yeah. there is Cl and then there is cloud spotter which literally contains a, da a guitar if dave god has been sitting on for two and a half decades yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah dave <laughs> and my big thing about this album is that where are the choruses where are the like big incendiary explosive choruses that like mm. I love from the Foo Fighters mm. and uh, just I have been a lifelong Foo Fighters fan for, mm. you know, yeah, since fair. you know, the big me video. And my favorite is, you know, in your honor, uh, disc one, which is one of the greatest rock albums in history. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where I would put it because, you know, subs as for substance, it's I don't think there's like anything in the lyrics, but it is just a fire album from start to finish musically. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and again, we'll probably get, we'll probably talk about at some point. We're getting a lot of things that we're going to, we're going to talk, talk about, about in this episode. But, yes. Um, yeah. but we're, you know, talking about the al albums themselves, they're, uh, mm. they're, they're missing. It feels like they're missing pieces. Yeah. And, and like, and, uh, it's like the, the first song they have on this one was the big single they had from. The other one, uh, the name is escaping me for a second. Making a fire, sorry. making a fire, which making was a like, fire. And which like, was the last single, yeah. single of the thing, and was produced by, uh, as I said, is you know produced by uh, had a version which was produced by Mark Ronson, which is sort of indicate the sort of the number of people that uh, 
are hanging around with the Foo Fighters these days. Yeah. And uh, the verse is good. The bridge yeah. is good. And then they get to the chorus and it's na, 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 na. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, all right. You had all that build up for that. And yeah, that's like every song that they put on the DG's album. Yeah. It's like, and I understand it's like, you know, you know, considering that, you know, the, the medicine of midnight came out in 2001. I mean, this is like, you know, hell Satin came out, it comes out barely five months after. And it's like, yeah, we don't, really we can't really tour these and to be honest by the time we do tour this album most of these are going to be off the set list anyway <laughs> um yeah, yeah i think the only reason <laughs> according to wikipedia and like the article linked with it the only, the reason they did this was because they did it live for uh a certain yeah L linda perry's rock and relief live stream yeah and then dave grohl was like this is the easiest song I've ever sung in my life. And they're like, let's do more of this. So yeah, uh, they did that. And mm -hmm. so they like, they decided to do more of it, but um, yeah, which we don't have it, a problem with. It's like, you know, the, yeah. so, I mean, it's like the thing, you know, the flaming lips, you know, that great American psychedelic rock band have done like three or four albums where they've covered an album cover. To, I don't have a problem with a band covering, you know, another band, you know, there's some great albums where, you know, Metallica did two albums where they just covered stuff, and it's like it's great because you sort of so. But it, it's almost like Dave has gone. Hang on a minute, we could just we couldn't do like more of this because I can do a, a, a passing, you know, um, impression Barry of the Gib. Gib. Barry Gibb. It's like okay, um, yeah. cool. Uh, let's just do five of these, and then we can pair them up with another five, and it's like, yeah, cool. <laughs> But the yeah. problem, the problem is that the, it, the, that is, you know, I don't have a problem with the Bee Gees half of this album. The Bee Gees half of this album no. are solid Bee Gees covers. It's when that needle skips over to the second half and making a fire rolls up that it's like, Dave, <laughs> Dave, this isn't very good, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get shame, yeah. you get shame, shame, which I think is probably the best track on, you know, yeah. Medicine at Midnight, and it's like. I and even that is like a solid two out, you know, solid three star sounding song. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I liked it better when I listened mm. to it more because it is the, yeah. like the biggest thing when you get, when you become the biggest act in the world is mm. that once you start like not relating to people, you just start making these universal <laughs> lyrics yeah. and, you know, poetry stuff that sometimes it works. Sometimes it's just yeah. like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Um, the biggest thing is uh, Noel Gallagher when he did his solo stuff. Like, oh, the, God. <laughs> yeah, it's like all all of his songs. I mean, the music for the first two albums was fine, but then mm. you listen to the, you know, albums, and sometimes you get like the girl with the X-ray eyes, and like, oh, that's kind of cool because it's a girl who can see right through you and what you're trying to do, and it's like, okay, that's kind of cool, and then yeah. You listen to the rest of it, and it's just like, what are you saying? Why are you saying this? And, who, who is this address? Yeah. Taking over your brain now, <laughs> yeah. and you know that's kind of what I feel like. Yeah, uh, it's like and I, I, mm. I like I will listen to these songs with the lyrics in front of it, and it's just like, uh, Dave. Uh, <laughs> no son of mine is like I don't know what he's trying to do. Is he trying to be sarcastic? Is he trying to be real? I don't know what he's trying to say about his. Mm. It's like. Is he trying to, is he like the bad, trying to be the bad father? Is he trying to be a good father? And he's just like being angry at the rest of the world. And I just don't know what this song is trying to do. Mm. Yeah, that is the that is sort of a problem that I think has sort of come into the, you know, the Foo Fighters to an extent. It's like, you know, I, as I said, I thought Concrete and Gold was, which, you know, is again about a, an album about three years ago was very, very good. And, you know, it's sort of like, holy shit, Dave, you can actually rock, and it's like, you can still be aggressive and mm -hmm. angry, and, you know, there's, you know, and and it's kind of weird to sort of look at, you know, Medicine at Midnight, which is, you know, an album produced for all intents and purposes during the sort of the dying days of the Trump administration, and it's like, mm -hmm. guys, what 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 is this? You know, this is, like, you, the last record you did which was basically, you know, made at the start of the Trump administration, was angry and ferocious and, you know, and it's just like, this is just, 
And he compares, and Dave Grohl compares it to like Let's Dance, which is you know the Bowie album I care for least out of you know that mm -hmm. the, out of his discography. And it's like, but Dave, this is just this isn't even Let's Dance because at least Let's Dance was produced by Nile Rodgers and and genuinely was a good and extremely well made record. This is just your clearing house of, of, of stuff that you be you've been trying to get onto albums for XYZ number of years, except it isn't because you released a load of stuff in twenty nineteen that was basically a clearing house for a lot of stuff you had sitting around. So mm. what is this day? Yeah, uh, I Yeah. Yeah. I mean we like I said, we thought about discussing medicine at midnight, mm. but it's just like I didn't have enough yeah. for it when I would listen to it and it's like every time I tried to listen to it I just forgot it immediately. Mm. Yeah. I mean that that's my biggest problem mm. um lately like with their albums like uh Sonic Highways um it's fine. Yeah. I don't remember any of the songs. I don't know. I couldn't tell you how any of the songs mm. went, but when I'm listening to it it's okay. And Concrete and Gold I had the same problem. I don't remember any of the songs off of it. So and yeah. this is just Which is fair. But they, they are Foo Fighters songs, and they are fine. Mm. These are just, these feel bland. incomplete, and <laughs> yeah. it's bland, and it's just like, it, it is, the Foo Fighters, you know, as they have gotten older, you know, they've de definitely gotten, you know, like, lighter. They become, like, mm. you know, they've leaned in more into their sense of humor than their need for hard rock and their, and, you know, their love. Yeah. And, but they've never become, like, the band who is just, you know, 20 years past their prime and just releasing albums to release albums. Yeah. Well, they've but, not turned uh, into, uh, for example, I just want to think of a band we could compare this to now without getting really, really grumpy. Oh, um, let me think. Uh, the, the Nickelback. There we go. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I want to say garbage, but it's just like garbage is evolution. I mean, at least in mm. like, once they got like, quote, quote unquote, past their prime, they still release like songs that were used in the Metal Gear Solid Five uh, yeah. trailer. Yeah. So I mean, they they still had some stuff. It's just like they were a lot more comfortable with who they are. So hmm. like their rage is more sarcastic than yeah. you know just like felt. And yeah, that, absolutely. Have, sar sarcasm doesn't really get into music and doesn't get yeah. felt very well unless it is like seething sarcasm it's yeah. like a raging indictment that you want to do but you can't do so you have to do it this yeah. way and that's the yeah. only way it works so uh, like and, and, he, and that hasn't been around really since this you know the, the the heyday of you know either the 90s where every band was just literally oh my god man everything is you know like okay but it's just like you know snarky grumpy you know thing or, or the high days of, of you know stuff like panic at the disco and you know fallout boy where everything is just you know very arch and very you know yeah very every everything ironic. is catty yeah everything is and, very catty and bitchy and, and uh, as i've had that like convert <laughs> which is weird that panic at the disco and fallout boy have a rivalry with each other because they sound like the exact same band except one yeah. uses samples more and one's more of a rock band yeah <laughs> fight me fight me i'm right <laughs> if you want to fight joe please uh don't because <laughs> we did. yeah but no and it's like the problem is with like you know the second half of this is like guys why not just do more covers? It's like, you know, if, if if the Foo Fighters want to do, you know, I would happily, you know, for the other great satin wearing band, why not the Foo Fighters covering the Moody Blues? That would be really fucking cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the the most, you know, the, the most middle American band that ever middle America, you know, why, <laughs> why not, why not do that? Why not just do double satin and have, you know, the, the most, the, 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 you know, the, the unquestionable kings of, of white disco. And and you know the moody blues, but the problem is it's like right. the problem is it has to be you know you, the second half of this has to be you know okay guys we've had our fun as the DGs now let's go back to being the Foo Fighters and let's really rock and it's like, but what you've done on the first half of this album is darker and more aggressive than what you're doing on the second half of the album as yourselves. What gives mm -hmm. guys? And it's like, and then we'll get to so the first half of this album. The, the first half of this album, where the Foo Fighters are in character, 
so to speak, as as the DGs, I think is genuinely enjoyable. Yeah. Um, I had to disconnect myself from the original recordings because I've lived with them for, yeah. you know, almost 40 years. Yeah. And Which, which I, frankly, you know, haven't had to do because I haven't no. really heard the Bee Gees that much. And it's like, the weirdest thing is, uh, uh, my first introduction was the, for the Bee Gees was uh, more than a woman used in uh, Short Circuit, which was another John Badham movie. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> it, which is about the... Uh, you know, robot that becomes self-aware Johnny Five, oh, and God. he is dance he is dancing with uh, Ali Sheedy to more than a woman as well, like uh, reference to John Badham's you know other woman other movie. So oh, that that's how I got introduced. And it's like oh that's that's, the, the, that's a movie. And then it's that's like as that. you get like eight or nine years old, and it's like oh that's a pretty song. Yeah. <laughs> and, it would be years before I watched Saturday Night Fever because that's absolutely a movie I shouldn't watch when I'm a kid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I frankly wouldn't recommend just watching it anyway because John Travolta is John Travolta. Yeah. But there we go. But yeah, so the first half of this really rattles through, as I said, three of the sort of the Bee Gees best hits. I mean, the Night Fever cover on this, I'm going to be blunt, is actually probably the... the, the, the uh, not quite the, the, the worst of the... Because it's not... Bad. none of these yeah. covers are bad it's just yeah it's night fever you're not exactly reinventing it guys. i mean none of the the, the only thing i will no. say against this track is considering what the free fighters have done with you know other mm -hmm. songs that they have covered i mean for example as i said we were while we were sort of listening you know obviously getting ready for this episode we were discussing obviously the really good cover of baker street you know which is you know which is a song I think the Foo Fighters make their own. It's like, you have just, mm -hmm. you know, by taking out the most iconic piece of Baker Street and transferring that guitar, that um, saxophone melody to a guitar, it's, holy shit, this is genuinely, you know, a bold decision. You, you've you taken probably the greatest saxophone piece um, part of the of rock and roll and gone, yeah, we can put that on the guitar, mate. It's fine. And and the, the, okay. the have a, and even the Have a Cigar cover, which is, you know, basically <laughs> bolstered by having Brian May on it because Brian May makes everything better. It's yeah, still, still a good cover. The the thing is, I mean, it's it's a good cover. It's a good. They made it a good rock song, yeah. but the problem is, it like takes out the bite of the commentary. Yeah, because <laughs> it is. I mean, Have a Cigar is a extremely snarky. Yeah, snarky, <laughs> like one of those aggressively sarcastic songs about. Like record producers, yeah. and you know you will know exactly what it's about yeah. and what its attitude is mm. the moment you hear it, and you do not hear that on uh, the Foo Fighters uh, version. No. Foo Fighters <laughs> cover, yeah. which was on the Mission Impossible Two soundtrack, oh, which God. is the most sell outy of sell outy things. The most given... cursed soundtrack in history. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't call it the most cursed. There, there are some things I could think of. I mean, not at the moment, but uh, <laughs> I will think of them later when it's like, oh, damn, I should have said that. <laughs> Joe, but... Joe, Joe, Joe. It has it has I Disappear on it by Metallica, which was the track involved in the Napster lawsuit, which makes it the most cursed album of all time. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> if, if you say so, I, and... I would be more... If there's anything I would say would be more cursed on it, it is uh, the Limp Biscuit oh, God, yeah, getting that. being the ones who have the God, Mission Impossible God. theme, and it's like it's not that they don't do a bad job with the theme; it's that what they choose to be about the 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 song to be about is about how they're whining about the critics yeah, hating it's... them because hate is all they've seen lately. When your first breakout song, Fred Durst, is a sarcastic cover of Faith and how much you hate that fucking song. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good co it's a good version of the Mission Impossible song um, theme, except the moments that Fred Durst opens his mouth on it, which is unfortunate. <laughs> and then he just sounds like a whiny schnauzer that hasn't been fed for the day, and it's like, no, I know why you want to <laughs> hate me. But yeah. It's also, yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah so. it's just, but the thing is, it's like, you know, I feel there's almost sort of something quite, you know, people with, with the Bee Gees, it's like, you can only do so much with the Bee Gees before the Bee Gees stop sounding like the Bee Gees. It's the thing, you know, you, what mm. you go into a Bee Gees, 
you go into a cover for the Bee Gees, you know, even if we talk about the tragedy cover which Steps did, which is, you know, a essentially yeah. a a boy girl band covering, you know, the Bee Gees, this this song about, you know, essentially infidelity. <laughs> um Yeah. It's like <laughs> you can you can only make that sound, you know, it's still basically sa- it's almost indistinguishable from the original apart from the fact that nobody sounds like Barry Gibb on it. <laughs> Yeah, um, although I do like Tragedy and You Should Be Dancing because mm. there was a there's a problem with the BG songs that they it's sort of in a moment and it's not mm. an aggressive it's not moving towards something like Tragedy mm. like it's an aggressive song it moves towards something but uh, when you listen to the original it still kind of sounds just like a BG song mm. like it it fits. It, I mean, it's definitely not, you know, about the same thing as, you know, Night Fever or More Than a Woman, but it, it kind of ha- it has the same, the sameness. Yeah. And yeah. on here, since the Foo Fighters are a rock band, You Should Be Dancing and Tragedy are more aggressive. Like yeah. the instruments come first and they are what are driving it more than the, you know, the smooth vocals are with the BG stuff. Indeed, so yeah. That, those tracks go a lot harder and they feel a lot better than they did on the originals. Mm, yeah, I would agree with that. And and I think the fact is that the sort of the last two tracks are comparatively deep cuts. I mean from from my perspective, you know, as somebody who has never listened to much of the Bee Gees, it's like you um, go with one song that is by the Gibbs younger brother Andy, which obviously I don't think is actually a Bee Gees song but was produced was sung by him and more than a woman that is you know a comparatively less lesser known track off the uh, Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. Yeah, but uh, the thing is, all of the Saturday Night Fever soundtracks were big in America. Like, oh god, it yeah. is the thing that made <laughs> disco the giant it was for a yeah. couple of years. Yeah, and <laughs> um, every song off of that was yeah. essentially big. I mean, it might not have been made the charts as a single, but that album. <laughs> by itself was gigantic. And yeah. Like night fever, shadow dancing and more than a woman, mm. like kind of feel on the same level. Uh, you should be dancing and tragedy were more of the deeper cuts over here. Yeah. I, I mean, this is, you got to consider these are three cuts off an album that sold 40 million copies. Yeah. <laughs> and was on the uh, number one charts, uh, was, was on billboards charts, uh, for two years. <laughs> like, it, are... is, it is one of those things where I <laughs> I cannot begin to tell you how absolutely popular that this mm. stuff was. Like even the uh cover of Beethoven in the 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 disco Beethoven cover oh, was God. like big and like yeah. night night on Disco Mountain, like all of these uh were like a made made a yeah. mark on pop culture back then. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't alive, so I couldn't tell you. But it's it's one of those, like when you know the '90s came along, like CNC mm. Music Factory were huge, and they had hypercolor shirts that turned from bright blue to bright pink, and everybody was wearing these, mm. you know, huge neon colors, and it's like the future in 2015. In Back to the Future Two was based on what where we were going in 1990. So, mm. yeah, it's so it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so nobody believes it, but this 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 is what happened. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it I mean, we are talking about something that is absolutely as a piece of cinema and as a piece of you know a musical document is absolutely epoch defining. I mean, I can't think of anything perhaps except the Bodyguard soundtrack, which ironically is actually the 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 only soundtrack that has outsold you know saturday night fever in terms of an audio visual piece of piece of work you know that goes yeah this is huge and this is like genuinely a a demarcation between periods of cinema and music yeah and the weird (laughs) but the weird thing about the bodyguard is nobody remembers the movie i mean i know people who remember saturday night fever it was Mm. genuinely considering one of the best films of the decade Mm. Yeah. But uh, the bodyguard was got mixed to pan reviews. I think I remember one uh, person on Entertainment Weekly called it the worst movie of the '90s. Oh, wow. uh, I don't know if I'd agree with that. I I've just seen it once and I forgot it. But and that soundtrack, 
uh, was driven like the Titanic soundtrack was driven by one song. Like I remember a second song off the bodyguard soundtrack, mm. but Saturday night fever, the entire soundtrack was the, the late seventies. Yeah. This is the seven, this is the seventies in all its magnitude. <laughs> <laughs> and, I don't know if I would call it that cause you have the early seventies. Yeah. Well, le- you the, late, like the, the late, se- the late seventies, the late seventies. Yeah. Sort of it's all, all its magnitude. And do you know what? I think the Foo Fighters do a pretty good job at sort of, you know, bringing back a little yeah. bit of that epoch. You know, yeah. it's it's night. I mean, you got to consider the Foo Fighters are probably after, you know, Bruce Springsteen and the E Band. Probably, you know, the big, you know, the band that that sums up, you know, Middle American rock. Probably mm. most ne- now, you know. Yeah. And it's like, oh my god, this band are doing five, you know, taking time out, you know, is, you know, of their schedule of of, of doing some Bee Gees covers. Neat. Mm-hmm. It's nice to uh, it's nice for the, to see a a a, a more playful side to a, to a band yeah. of that size. And uh, my first thing was to be extremely nitpicky, because you know yeah. I have you know, lived with the original so long. And it's like, if it's different, it means it's bad. And that's how the brain works and it shouldn't, but it does. But, uh, I mean, if the things I got was like, the instruments are far more intrusive than the, uh, instrumentation on the Bee Gees, which everything was in, felt like it was in harmony with each other. Mm. And there, there's just like the instruments are slightly mixed more to be Mm. more aggressive, which, and then like, I thought, oh, that's an advantage. And uh, the other thing is, like, Dave Grohl's voice, it's... Uh, uh, it During the verses, it sounds like he is... Sarca- he is, like, mocking somebody, nagging at them. It's like, oh, are you going to do that? It's like... Da, 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 da. <laughs> or something like that. But, yeah. Uh, but... Uh, you know, it's, it's fine. Like, uh, the thing anybody will tell you about falsetto voices is you could be 95% of the there and the 5% you're missing can ruin everything. So he gets about 97% there and there's just enough to criticize and, you know, have it open, but Mm. that as much of it works as it does is great because like, there are not a lot of people who can do this well. (laughs) And Dave Grohl can do it, and that he thinks it's like an easier voice is, you know, My probably blood. says how long he has just like wrecked his vocals on uh, all of his albums, like yeah. you know, is especially his harder earlier stuff. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, it's like the Dave. This this is easy for you, you know, the the thing that a lot of yeah. vocalists struggle with. Oh my god! But as as. Uh, <laughs> Somebody who lo- constantly listened to the color of the shape and including the really rough ones where he j- it's like, like he should have destroyed his voice after the yeah. color of the shape. And I don't know how he maintained it, but it, you know, there's, there's always that secret vocal training that, yeah. you know, all the people get that, you know, makes them able to handle this and yeah. makes me not so much like I, uh, like when I do rock band, I have, I bought all of the color of the shape on rock band uh i think two and um uh, Mm. i can only do the vocals on um walking after you which is also a song that i fail constantly because the version i remember and the better version is on x files i want to believe where you know his moaning is like uh it's not so monotone. It is like more aching and more needing mm. and, and it works on the, I want to believe one more than it does. Cause it just feels a little too stiff on the color and the shape, but the rock band version is the color and the shape. So every time I try to do the more emotional one, the vocal says, no, that's wrong. You fail. <laughs> it's like, so, but that's not how I remember. <laughs> no, it, it it also happens to me on the perfect drug. Like there's some, like once it goes to the instrumental breakdown, mm. it's like, there's some like moaning that I can't, or some like grumbling that I cannot make out from the song. 
that is at the end of the rock band thing that um, for some trend. reason I I cause it I caused to fail because there's because all the vocals do to help you is go it's like it's like I don't know what you want from me rock band <laughs> yeah not to mention that's the song that apparently did Nine Shells never play live because their drummer's arms would fall off <laughs> yeah oh yeah oh boy it's a great song though it is a very good song. But no, I I, I, I enjoy I enjoyed the Bee Gees half of this. I, I will say this, you yeah. know, the satin half of this is is good. The hail part may be less less uh, less exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's it's hard to say, you know, get more in depth because they are good covers. Um, hmm. Once you get used to like they have uh, more prominent female backing vocals than the Bee Gees had because hmm. it was like four guys harmonizing. And, uh, you know, hmm. once you get used to like the quirks and like the instruments play more of a part and like Dave Grohl is in a one-to-one -one match, you know, but again, you don't want the exact songs, even though these are kind of the exact same songs. Yeah. Just, it's just rock sensibilities more than disco sensibilities. Hmm. So, but they work fine. So, you know, you get what you want out of it. I just, when I heard Foo Fighters doing a disco album, I was expecting more than, okay, we're just going to do like the baseline and the most popular songs. I'm, the Foo Fighters are usually a smart and more an adventurous band that like gets a little bit of everybody and they, they kind of love everybody. Mm. Um, so I've, just regular people and you know motorhead and you know even harder stuff than that so yeah uh that they're not really adventurous and that that is kind of is a gimmick was the most mm. disappointing thing it was an easy thing to get over however and you know the best that it's fine <laughs> it's fine yep. it's better than the medicine at midnight songs it's it's it is it's like you know competent songwriting this is this is unusual to hear in price proximity to stuff for medicine at midnight <laughs> I don't want to be too mes mean to Medicine at Midnight because yeah. obviously they did that uh, during a pandemic yeah. and in, a, according to reports <laughs> at a ha very haunted house. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the advantage of Medicine at Midnight is, is, is the uh, the DGs is apparently they rolled up to what was it, a Westboro um, protest and just blasted um, as as the DGs just disco at horrible, <laughs> horrible, shitty Christians. Yeah. Which is which is always you know the which is the true power of disco. Yeah. Yep, and the true power of rock. Yep. So it so you know it may not combine as well as we want it, but it, at least it combines enough, I guess. Yep. Yeah. All right. So cool. uh, you were you were thinking about how we you were going to introduce the next thing because we do have <sighs> another schedule change. So we have a schedule change. Uh, we will be moving back. Um, our look at the action-packed red line a little bit because a certain British heavy metal band uh, have their 17th album out. Um, we are going to be taking a Patreon-exclusive look, which probably means you'll, you normal people on YouTube, you will be listening to this sometime in uh, early October. Or not, I might change what we said when it, when this comes out. Uh, we will be taking a look at Iron Maiden. Yeah, this is a new and exciting thing where I subject Joe to yet more heavy metal. Um, we will be taking yeah, a look at uh... the 17th album by Iron Maiden entitled Senjetsu, which is out uh, in about uh, just under two weeks. So obviously we will be talking about that. We will obviously because it is a double album. We're not going to be just launching ourselves into that straight away. So <laughs> Joe is about to do some very a lot of uh, very very quick research on the forty I, plus I year. I have to take a deep dive in uh, Iron Maiden because it is a blind spot. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. I, sh shamefully so, but it, it is. It is. They are very British. So, yeah, that will be our next Patreon episode. And then, obviously, we return to our normal schedule uh, with Redline. Uh, and then, obviously, after Redline, we will be talking uh, in our return to music um, with uh, DJ Shadow. 
The Outsider. Outsider. And then we might have something very, very special planned because we are coming up very quickly on a, uh, a landmark number of episodes. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we will we will obviously get to that bridge when we cover it. Um, obviously, if you are a if you obviously would like to uh, schedule a Patreon episode, because we are more than more than happy to uh, take a deep dive into either the worlds of anime, music, or in fact anything you want us to pay us to talk about. To be honest, um, you can do that by subscribing to our Patreon, which is at. Uh, patreon.com forward slash the tom and joe show there's a card little card saying that should be coming up right now uh and if you want to sort of follow in follow our, our behind the scenes um thing you can also follow us on uh, twitter at uh, not so final prod or one word um so yeah we, we 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 are we are staying in the world of music uh, next time so anyway right. until next time ladies and gentlemen we we have been tom I'm Joe. And uh, this has been the Foo Fighters uh, Hail Satin. <laughs>